Well, I just want to welcome you again, Dave. We are really happy to have you here at San Francisco Dharma Collective. I've always loved your sets and uh, just really excited to have you here. So I'll let you go ahead and take it away and uh, tell us uh, what it is. All right, everybody. My name is Dave Smith. It's good to be here again. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a program uh, called Mindfulness-Based Ethical Living. Um, and so what we'll do this evening is I will just kind of do uh, just a kind of a brief intro about myself. I'll do a little bit of an overview of the program, uh, and then we'll take some questions and answers. And then I'll do a little bit more, and then we'll do some more questions and answers. So I, I, my, my hope is that this is a bit more of a dialogue, perhaps, than me just talking the whole time. Uh, we may do a short practice, I'm not sure. There's, there's a lot to cover. Um, so anyway, I want to I wanna make, make sure we have time for discussion. So I don't want to hold all the questions to the end. So I'll kind of give you a little bit and unpack it. And then we can uh, we can move on. So um, thank you. Uh, yeah. So my name is Dave Smith. Um, I'll just give you the numbers real quick. I'm 48. I have two kids and a wife. I live in rural Colorado. Um, I'm I've been practicing since I was 18. So I've been practicing for about 30 years. Um, most of my practice, I would say, really all of my practice, has been rooted in what we would probably call the Theravada or really the Insight tradition, as you know it here in the United States. Spirit Rock, IMS all that this very kind of culture of Dharma that you're all probably very familiar with. I was also um, trained to teach by um, through the Against the Stream uh, Meditation Society. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that organization, um, which is no longer with us, unfortunately, and, and worked very closely with Noah Levine and Vinnie Ferraro as my core teachers for quite a period of time and was really happy to be part of that organization during, I would say, the heyday of, of Against the Stream. I really I feel grateful that I was teaching and practicing and part of that uh, and in quite sad uh, that it has ended up where it has ended up um, and I continue to teach. Um, and so just just to begin to see kind of just put my cards a little bit more cleanly on the table, I have always struggled with this kind of secular, you know, so I've taught secular mindfulness, I've taught in jails and prisons and institutions, I taught at the National Public Library, I'm very comfortable teaching mindfulness in a secular context, using kind of mindfulness based um, uh, stress reduction, that kind of language, very, very comfortable with that, and, and really think that's very valuable. Um, but I've also had mixed feelings about that. I always felt like, is this thorough? Is this enough? Is this watered down Dharma? I've always kind of had some ethical dilemma around it. Uh, and then at other times I was really, I've taught Dharma, you know, classic Dharma, um, you know, Theravada Buddhism, insight retreats with five precepts and four noble truths and all this stuff. And I, and for many years, I kind of waffled back and forth. You know, I would, sometimes I think, oh, I just want to teach secular mindfulness. I just want to do the science-based stuff. I just want to help the wider audience of people. And then other times I'd be like, no, I just want to be a Dharma person. I don't want to do this secular mindfulness thing. And I've kind of danced between the two with actually quite a bit of confusion until really many years ago. And so um, I always thought that the merger of those two worlds would probably be the best move. So how do we bring the secular and the Dharma together in a way that is respectful to the tradition in which it came from. And that is also um, respecting what we've learned in science and psychology and therapy and, and all these things. How, how can we respect the tradition and go, you know, how do we adapt an ancient tradition to uh, modern times? And I think a lot of people really uh, don't feel like they fit in anywhere. Maybe you feel this way. Um, we don't have a necessarily a Sangha or a community. Um, and so a lot of us feel like we're just homeschoolers at best. We're just, we go on a retreat once in a while. We listen to this teacher. We listen to that teacher. We read this book. And we, we're kind of left to kind of choose your own adventure book. Um, the one person I want to make a plug for, who you all know very well, Eve Ekman, I think, has done a tremendous job in her work bridging the gaps between Buddhism and, and contemplative practices with her program, Cultivating Emotional Balance, which I'm also trained to teach. I was part of that. So I, I, bring, I bring a lot of stuff here to the table. And so also, I just want to say mindfulness-based ethical living, what we call MBEL, is really meant to be and designed to be a really companion to everything. You know, if you if you're if you're deep into mindfulness based stress reduction and you're maybe kind of feel a little cagey about some of the Buddhist stuff and the religiosity and the esoteric, don't worry about it. 
Uh, all, if you're an insight person, uh, if you've been teaching sitting insight retreats or Vipassana retreats, much of what's said in MBEL, that language is going to resonate with you. And even if you're in other various forms of Buddhist practice, whether you're in the Zen tradition or, or different schools of, of the Tibetan uh, lineages, everything that we teach here is stuff that's really not going to be new to you. It's just been categorized in a way uh, that we think is very efficient. Uh, and really, again, respects the tradition that it comes from, but organize it, is it, organizes it in a way so that way, you know, we're busy people. We live busy lives. We live in the modern world. Shit moves fast. Like, how do we actually have a practice, a contemplative practice, a Dharma practice that actually meets the complexity and the demands of the lives that we live nowadays? Now, I also am a big fan of, and I and I don't speak negatively ever of the Buddhist monastic tradition, but I think that they they that leaves much wanting for us who don't engage in that kind of way. I mean, I, I deal with money, I deal with sexuality, I live in society, I live in culture, I, I, I deal with the world. And so a lot of times Buddhist monasticism hasn't left us a very sophisticated or really effective trail of breadcrumbs on how to navigate that basically because they just don't. And maybe they're onto something. <laughs> maybe they're onto something. So, um, so yeah. Again, just to put my cards on the table, I actually don't consider myself a Buddhist. I, I don't resonate with a lot of Buddhism. I don't really like any ism, for that matter. Um, I think that um, what we're trying to do is to try to try to develop a program that that politely respects that, but leaves a lot of that stuff behind. The, the hierarchy, the teacher who has all the answers, uh, the esoteric, the karma, the rebirth, all of these kind of religious esoteric ideas. We just kind of politely put those aside and say, well, that's actually not what we're doing here. Uh, we're not rejecting that. We're just not doing that. Um, and so to just also say uh, one of the teachers that, that i'll give the credit to stephen bachelor probably many of you have heard his name before he's very well respected and, and to some degree quite controversial uh, buddhist teacher because he has lots of ideas about the practice and he has really in his last 40 or 50 years of studying and practicing and teaching dharma has sort of categorized this program uh, and is really just kind of offering it to the world as something that is available that's out there um, and because I've been working with him for so long and so closely, him and I were going to be doing a program together anyway uh, in 2024, which I'll speak more about, which we're actually we're going to part of the, doing this tonight is to let you know that we are doing trainings and we're doing this eight month program. So if you want to do more of this, it's going to be more available. Um, so I've been been working with him. And so we're really just kind of getting this um, out to the world. Um, so he, you know, he's been practicing, teaching, studying for 40, 50 years and has really um, taking most of the, let's say, let's just use the word Dharma from here on out, the Dharma as it's as it found in the earliest teaching. So not even Theravada, pre-Theravada, what's now kind of talked about, and even IMS is using this language, Biko now is using this language of early Buddhism. Now, early Buddhism is primarily the teachings that are found in the pages of the Pali Canon. Now, most people know, uh, public service announcement, all uh, of the teachings that we see in Buddhism do originate at, to some degree in the pages of the Pali Canon. It's not a fun book to read. It's not light material. It's 5,000 some odd pages of texts that are not organized in any, in any way, shape or form. But, but it is understood and it is pretty much agreed upon that this text, the Pali Canon, is likely the best version of what we have that would represent what this historic figure Siddhartha Gautama may have taught. Um, and so um, with that, um, we look at it not as a doctrine, not as a Bible, if you will, not as the answer, but we use it more from a secular point of view as kind of an academic reference. So um, we're saying that, that, that you know, we're, we're looking at these lists, we're looking at what's in the early Buddhist texts, and we're saying, here's what's there, but, we, but, but we're going to question it. We're going to talk about it. So a lot of the uh, emphasis on mindfulness-based ethical living is for it to be more of a dialogue and a community um, conversation rather than, I, the, here's the teacher, here's the student, I have all the answers, that kind of you know, which is not really actually, if you go into the Dharma hall or you go on a Buddhist retreat or you go into any Buddhist Dharma context, it's kind of not very polite 
or very much allowed or encouraged to question what's being said. Right. And so, but if you go to college or university, anybody who's ever taken Western education, that's actually very well uh, encouraged. In fact, that's, that, that's how we learn is we, we, we question ideas, we have debates, we discuss these ideas. And I think that, I think that modern scholarship offers that in a way that can be, that can be very utilized here in a friendly way. So we, you know, we're taking a lot of the, so when we're talking about mindfulness, um, especially particularly from an early Buddhist perspective, that kind of is the OG original Buddhist meditation. Mindfulness, as you all know, is kind of everywhere now. Um, we see mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. In fact, actually, you'll see the word mindfulness-based parked in a lot of things nowadays. They kind of park that up front, which I think is actually great because mindfulness just seems to be really useful in any therapeutic capacity. Some degree of mindfulness is really valuable. And so um, as much as uh, MBSR, MBCT, they don't, they offer kind of a preliminary perspective on mindfulness that doesn't really address some of the deeper things that we do. So generally what we see is in, in secular mindfulness is that mindfulness is mostly taught to kind of treat a pathology. So I have stress, I have anxiety, I have trauma, I have, you know, I, I have whatever I have. And I go to the mindfulness clinic, I go to the mindfulness teacher, and I use mindfulness as a therapeutic mindfulness, which is one of the four mindfulnesses I'll talk about more. Um, so we use mindfulness as a kind of a therapeutic way to help us with our psychological, with our emotional, with our relational struggles that we have in life. And we find that mindfulness is helpful in that capacity. But that's really about as far as it goes. And so um, when we think about mindfulness here, we want to think about it really in, in, in four particular ways. And so when you look at the early Buddhist texts, now also Biko Anayo has done a lot of work on this, but he doesn't really address it this way. Goldstein has a book on it. The book that I love, I'll just kind of show it to you, by Fei Fu Quan. It's a very boring academic book called Mindfulness in Early Buddhism. Mm -hmm has this really interesting thing that he's studied the teachings of mindfulness in the Pali Canon rigorously from a very academic perspective. And he says, sati, which is the word for mindfulness, has been explained or described in very diverse ways and contexts in the Buddhist Canon. It seems that sati or mindfulness has different functions on different occasions for different purposes. Okay, different functions on different occasions for different purposes. Okay, so now that gives us a sense of the complexity of what it is. So the one thing I will say that we just want to be upfront about, and this is where the pushback might begin, is one of the things that where we're really making a departure from classic Buddhist thought, especially and particularly Buddhist soteriology and the way that Buddhism thinks about salvation, we look at the, the teachings of the Four Noble Truths. Now, we don't talk about them as noble truths in Mbell. We talk about them as four tasks, four things that you are able to do. And so, especially when you look in the early canon, one of the big things that we're saying is that, you know, typical presentation, there is suffering, there is the cause of suffering, there is the end of suffering, there is the path that leads to the end of suffering. Now, which word is listed in every one of those? Suffering. Well, in the early canon, suffering dukkha, as you know, dukkha is only mentioned in the first task. So we are not trying to end suffering um, in, in mindfulness-based ethical living at all. We're really upfront about that. We're actually trying to embrace suffering. Uh, and we, we look at the suffering world, we look at the pain of this world, and we're not trying to put an end to that. Um, to me, that actually is just riddled with a whole boatload of aversion anyway. I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I could. Uh, is that it, it, if it's not about uh, getting rid of dukkha, I don't believe that the Buddha taught the end of dukkha. I think that he taught to embrace dukkha, to fully know dukkha. It's very much written in the early canon. There's not much argument you can be made about that. And, and so what happens is what happened, probably the greatest turn, I think the greatest misstep in Buddhist thought was when they translated the term for the second truth, samudaya. We always know the, the second noble truth. The cause of suffering is craving. Have you heard this before? The cause of suffering is craving. Well, that's actually not what's in the original text. 
the cause, cause or origin gets translated from this word samudaya, which definitely does not mean cause or origin. It means to rise up. And no, no poly scholar is going to argue on that. So translating that as cause or origin, somebody did that later on. And so, uh, so what the, what the Buddha is saying is that, is that because life is hard, because life is difficult, because there's dukkha, we get confronted with challenges and struggles in our life. What rises up is, is a reactivity. So we use the term reactivity instead of craving. Uh, I think it encompasses more. So it encompasses that, that which we want to get through greed, that which we want to get rid of through hatred, craving and aversion, wanting and not wanting, and then the confusion about that whole endeavor. So, so really mindfulness based ethical living is premised on really it begins with care and kindness now if we look at the world that we live in and we look at the pain and the anguish and the suffering and all of the hardship of what it means to live in this world as a human being if we really embrace that on an existential level um it's a, it's a long call for care or the word that the buddha uses in the early discourse is uh, anukampa which means to cry out at the crying out of another. And so, so the, really the ethic of, of Embel is an, is an ethics of care, is that we care about our lives, we care about other people, we care about the planet, we care about the, the modernity of the world that we live in, and how do I relate and respond to the world that I live in in 2023 American society in a way that is both caring, that is kind, that is aware, that is honest, that is transparent, and that is, and that is saying yes to that, taking that on as a task. Because <laughs> let's be honest, this is, that is not easy to do, right? And, and, and to try to do that in a way. So really we're, we're working with that from an existential. So the first kind of mindfulness uh, that we teach and that we offer in Embel is that of an existential nature. The, the reality that we were born, that we're going to get Sick, that we're going to die, that we don't always get what we want. Sometimes we get what we don't want. Things don't go our way. We don't like the candidates that get elected. You know, all this dukkha, this is all dukkha, right? How do we, how do we embrace the existential condition of doing that? So we do this by the four foundations of mindfulness, by being in our bodies, by opening to our feelings, by opening to our mental states, to our ideas, to our views, to our concepts, right? So that's, that is really where this whole project begins, is, is how do we actually do that? And we're not, we're not trying to put that to an end. We're actually trying to embrace the, our humanity. Um, and so that, that is probably the big departure, and really kind of the only departure, I think, from, from Buddhist thought, is that we are not trying to end anything. We're trying to embrace, we're trying to understand, we're trying to be engaged with the life in the world and the conditions that we live in. I'll open it up here in just a minute, but I just also want to just highlight that one of the things that also gets really kind of muddied in Buddhist thought is we have to remember that liberation, Buddhist liberation, is a liberation within conditions. We liberate ourselves, we live a liberate, I know it's kind of a highfalutin word, liberated, but we live a life of freedom within the conditions that we have, within the social, political, financial, we, we're in our five aggregates, right? We're in, we're in here. And so we're, we can be liberated within our conditions, not without our conditions. A lot of times people think we're trying to meditate into some higher state. We're trying to get into some Buddhist heaven thing that if I meditate and I meditate right, I'm gonna have this uh, transcendent experience. I'm going to be enlightened as they say in later schools of Buddhism, which I think is um, a mistake. I think that's I think that kind of thinking is a mistake uh, and I think it causes lots of problems and it can cause things like spiritual bypass intellectual bypass. Um, uh, and, and, and I've and I've and I've done all this too. I just want to be clear i've done all this i've gone down all the rabbit holes. Um, I, I, I really consider myself the reason I don't like Buddhism and I don't really talk about it so much as I feel mostly like a Buddhist failure. I wasn't able to pull that one off. <laughs> um, so I could keep going and I, and I, and I want to pause here because I want to just take the time to just open it up to see if you have any questions or any thoughts about anything I've said already that might be arising in your mind or things you want me to speak about further or just questions you want to ask before I kind of get into a little bit of the more meat of the matter. Yeah, Julio, please. 
Uh, so yeah, what this is this all sounds really interesting. Um, and I am curious about how this is going to be presented. I know you're going to talk about a training that's coming up that you're going to be doing with Stephen Bachelor, but also like it sounds like there's like a compilation of maybe material, maybe like some of these Buddhist lists. So how how will people be able to like interface with the MBEL program as as it's created? Well, easily right out of the gate, you can just email me. I do have a document that I'm that I'm encouraged and invited to share that Stephen wrote a couple months ago. It's 36 pages. It's kind of the first text um, that have an, kind of the overview of MBEL. If you want to email me, you have my email, and I'll put my email on the screen later. If anybody wants a copy of it, I'm happy to send you the PDF, and you can take a look at it, no problem. Cool. Anybody else have any questions or thoughts you wanna you wanna bring up? Yeah, please. Make it work, make it work here. Hey, thank you, thank you, I, I thank you so much. A lot there, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> the idea too of, of 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 the dukkha, you know, the phrasing of dukkha in the first in the first noble truth, and and something that that has happened with Michael Owens. MC Owens classes that I've been attending is the concept of sukha. Yes, and how that is also suffering, the origin of, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of sukha, which is another another way of being, being way of pursuing. So I really want that new iPhone, and then I lose it. It's like, oh, I'm still suffering. That's <laughs> Just wanted right. to bring that up. Thank you, David. Yeah, no, that's great. I'll, uh, people are starting to turn the corner on this as well, so it's not that. Um, controversial, but it is, it is, it is not what Buddhism says clearly, you know, I just want to be straight up about that, that we're, we're sort of doing something different. And also too, it doesn't ch change a lot, whether you think there's an end of Dukkha or you don't, much of the practice and the things that we do all, they all stay the same anyway. So there's no, nobody needs to get all worked up about this, but I just, I, as somebody who has spent, I probably spent 10 or 12 years of my life really aggressively practicing and sitting and trying to live in a way I really tried to end dukkha uh, and it created so much other suffering so much spiritual bypass so much repression so I, I just mostly found that that I, um, as a person. Um, the the practice that I'm engaged in has to have a philosophical pragmatism to it, or I just kind of can't do it. So if it doesn't make sense to me or seem doable, it makes me fall into doubt. It makes me question the whole thing. And when I started to switch in this other way, things just kind of really started to line up a bit more. Um, anything else? And I'll talk a bit about ethics. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just, uh, could you just speak a little bit more of that term spiritual bypass for me? Thank you. Yeah, spiritual bypass, you know, it's not a great term, I, I think, for what it is. But it, basically what it is, is that we use spiritual ideas as a way to avoid or change or control some kind of dukkha or dissatisfaction in our life where we kind of explain it away through some kind of esoteric teaching uh you know uh like somebody who really i'll give you one of my examples is i uh spent much of my 30s alone and and i i i thought that uh i really actually wanted to have an intimate relationship i wanted to be in partnership i'd been divorced uh but i pretended i was kind of the spiritual person and i didn't need that and you know i i i kind of avoided so sometimes what happens is because of the things that we care about like being in a, in a committed relationship most of us can identify with that if that has been so painful to us like if there's been a lot of loss and a lot of trauma and a lot of like being in intimate relationships is really scary and painful. So I'm not going to fucking do that anymore. And at the same time, that's actually really what I want. We can kind of, I can, I can put that in a nice Buddhist little box or I can frame that up for myself in a way to explain that to other people so I can give myself permission to not do what's hard. So in many ways, what we're doing in MBEL is we're kind of trying to do what's hard. And, and embrace that loneliness, sadness, um, suffering. So yeah, I'm actually suffering. I'm really unhappy in my life right now. And I want, you know, and rather than trying to, to make everything sort of okay. All right. And that, and ironically, the, the, yes, you, Suzanne, please. Um, yeah, go ahead, finish. Ironically, what? I want to know. Um, 
if what turned me on to Dharma practice in the first place was it was the first time in my life I felt like I was in a location and I was with the teacher and I was in a practice and I was a way of thinking where suffering was actually totally allowed. So that was really kind of the thing that jacked me up over the years. I was like, I was so into the Dharma because I was like, oh, I can suffer here and A, nobody cares. I'm not being judged. And to some degree, it's to be expected. And so that really opened me to Dharma practice and to trusting teachers and to sitting long retreats. And then at some point I started to study and lead a bit and I got into this whole like, oh, you can end this. And then I got down that, that strategy. Cause that, I mean, let's be honest, so ending suffering is very nice looking on the brochure. You know, yeah, great marketing. I mean, it, it is. It's, that's what I was going to say is that I, you know, I originally got involved with practice as a way to alleviate some suffering that I was not not coping well with, not coping with at all. And um, it was very tempting to just use it as an avoidance mechanism because it works pretty well, actually. And it probably does for a little while. <laughs> a little while, exactly. But at the same time, um, I was doing work in, I'm sure you're familiar with ACT, Acceptance and Commitment sure, Therapy. Sure, yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, and I, what I love about that and which was really dovetailed with what you're talking about is this idea that, you know, I'm not going to get rid of my anxiety or my depression or my whatever my suffering is. That's not that's not the goal. The goal isn't to eliminate it. It's not this aspirational get to this place where I'm enlightened and it no longer happens. It's that like it's going to happen. And yet I'm going to be able to act within my values. I'm going to be able to carry on, you know, and and tolerate it and and still do the things that I need to do and want to do. And that to me is so much more practical than some kind of a goal of, yeah, reaching Nirvana. No, I'm, I'm really glad yeah. you brought that up because act, yeah. I'm familiar, it, it, this is very much in line with what we're after here at MBAL is like, you know, so, so to just say a little bit about ethics, cause I talked a little about mindfulness, I'll talk more. So ethics is, um, we don't really have an ethical map for you in MBAL. We, we want to help you we want to help you develop your own map so the word that we're finding that we see in early buddhism and all schools of buddhism is this word sila sila which is usually translated as morals or ethics now the problem with the word sila is it actually sits somewhere in the middle it sits kind of uncomfortably in the middle between ethics and morality so um so we would say that probably the, the most how would i say this the ethical map that we would offer or that we would value in Mbel would be that of the Brahma Viharas. So to try to be kind, uh, to try to be caring, uh, to try to be grateful and appreciative and, 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 and equanimous. Now, uh, most people are familiar with those ideas. They make a lot of sense. The thing about values, and you mentioned this word, Suzanne, I'm glad you did, is that uh, we all have different values and we all should probably have different values. Now, probably all of us, some of our values overlap. Some of us maybe have values that are maybe in controversy with each other. This is the world we live in. So um, we're trying to be aware of our values, which is kind of, for I don't like to use this word, but that's kind of my morality. I do have a moral compass that I try to adhere to. But the ethics of that is I don't try to force other people to adhere to my moral compass. So this is where the, the kindness is. So like if I'm in a situation where uh, somebody has an opinion and I have an opinion about some social or political situation, uh, the question is, do I want to impose my values on this person or my opinion on this person? Or do I want to be kind? Which one of those is going to be more skillful? Which is more important to me, my opinion or my commitment to kindness? Now I can tell you in my life, living out here in, in the reddest county in Colorado, um, I run into this stuff all the time. And, and I do believe, and I have found that for the most part, for those of us who live in the modern world, life is kind of one ethical dilemma after another. Should I do this? Should I do that? I wish I didn't say this to my partner. I wish I said that to my partner. I, you know, Do I let my four-year-old have a popsicle at seven o'clock in the morning or do I not let him have a set? You know, it's just like, it's just one ethical dilemma after another. And so that's a kind of a duka thing. And what that's telling me is I care, but I have to be careful how I navigate that. So we talk about ethics, um, but we don't impose ethics. 
ethics. We don't we don't have we don't have a list. We don't have a, like here's the ethics that Mbell has. We we just kind of uh, it's more to be collaborative. I hope that that makes sense. Um, and I think that that's more tolerant. That's more friendly. That's more of a secular ethics. A lot of these ideas uh, were inspired. I was inspired by a book by the Dalai Lama called Beyond Religion, which is a book on secular ethics, where a lot of these ideas come from, which is about about tolerance and openness. And 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 Eve Ekman helped me with this a lot, which is, I think Buddhism and Buddhist people, and no offense, but people in the Bay Area are very guilty of this, is that of contempt. Is that thinking that you have the superior moral perspective on things. And you know what? That's not skillful. Talk to Eve Ekman about contempt. That's what that is. Anytime we take a moral superior high ground towards another human being, we elevate ourselves, we devalue that other person. Uh, and we do this a lot. I do this a lot. So part of it is like, well, what's more important to me? Kindness? Can I be kind to the person who doesn't see things the way that I do? Or am I just going to assume my elitist status that I have the better perspective and they have the lower perspective? Um, that's hard work, you know? But, but the question is, for most of us, we find ourselves in situations like this a lot of the time. So the one thing about, I think, M. Bell that's really exciting is I think it offers and encourages a way to really bring your Dharma practice to life, to really actually bring it into your world through your speech, through your actions, through your livelihood, like really you know, a full path, which is also not a very mysterious Buddhist teaching, um, but really kind of bringing that more more front and center. So that's how that we hold uh, we hold ethics. Um, and so really, to, to some degree, the whole program rests on an ethics of care is that where we care, we're responding to the demands of the world that we live in from this place of care, uh, and that we are understanding that we're not going to get it right all the time. There's going to be a lot of confusion, but that's kind of the task that we're taking. That's kind of that first task is we're going to embrace life. Um, I hope that that makes sense. So uh, just to just kind of finish out the four tasks then. So we, 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 our task, our goal, our practice is to, to embrace the existential life that we're in, developing the foundations of mindfulness um, and really uh, embracing the world that we live in. Uh, task two is when we notice that reactivity rising up in ourselves, whether it's anger or fear or contempt or whatever that is, uh, not seeing that so much as craving or clinging, these kind of classic Buddhist terms, grasping, those are certainly part of it. But that is, um, and this is the therapeutic part of mindfulness, in the, heat, in the heat of the moment, can I let that reactivity be? Can I let it go? Can I let it be? Uh, which is the second actually great effort to overcome or to abandon unskillful forces that arise in the mind. Now, if you just spent your entire day tomorrow trying to embrace the difficulty of your life and overcome the destructive forces in your mind, if you just did those two things tomorrow, you'd have a pretty busy day, I suspect. Right? It's a lot of what we're dealing with. The third task is to, is to experience or to witness. Now, this is where MBSR in the particular mindfulness world really got it down, is, is, an, is to develop a non-reactive awareness or an, ab an ability to respond rather than to react. We use that terminology in, th in therapeutic circles everywhere. How do I respond to a situation rather than react? Also, we're highlighting the Buddhist concept of Nibbana, which is, which is a state of mind, a quality of mind that is a non-reactive awareness that is not being dictated by greed, hatred, and confusion. So Nibbana is not this Buddhist heaven up on a pedestal. Nibbana is actually a moment by moment skill. That's what it is. So we witness that, we recognize that, we value that, we see, okay, this is possible. Uh, we, we, we embrace these experiences of non-reactivity and that's, that's a task in and of itself. Now what that does, is that non-reactive space in the mind, which is really highlighted by secular mindfulness, so I think even more uh, skillfully than the Buddhist tradition, is now I can live my life. So Mbell is not about ending suffering, it's about embracing it, but it's really, it's actually about human flourishing. It's about living the life that you wanna live. It's about having a meaningful life. It's about thriving. Uh, it's, it's about you know all of those kinds of things. And so 
we look at you know if you look at the standard fourth truth the fourth noble truth is the path that leads to the end of suffering well that's not what that's not actually that's backwards so the eightfold path doesn't lead to nibbana nibbana the third task the experience of the non-reactive mind is the trailhead to the eightfold path it's the entry point so when i'm in a space of non-reactivity when i'm kind and i'm open and i'm easeful and and i'm non-reactive I have a much better view, my views, my perceptions, my opinions are more uh, clear and more in line with my values, so is my intention, so are my words, so are my actions. Everything flows from that place of Nibbana. And as soon as I, as soon as I get backed into reactivity, the access to the path is denied. And the access is denied until I overcome that reactivity and I get access again. And so when you look at, when you look in the Pali Canon, it doesn't say, that the Eightfold Path leads to the end of suffering. It says the Eightfold Path leads to a city. There's a sutta, you look it up, called the Ancient City. And it, it talks about, uh, about the Buddha said, I follow this Eightfold Path, and um, it led me to a city, which is very interesting that he uses this word city, uh, because I think it's really clear, and I'm excited about this, what the Buddha envisioned for humanity has never been done. Now, I think, and this is also many scholars think that in the original text, in the original, in the time, in the life of the Buddha, there were two Dharma paths. There was the monastic path, which he set up, which he developed, there's no doubt about that, which has done really, really well. And thank God, so grateful for the Buddhist monastic tradition. But then there was this other thing. There, was, there were people who were practicing the Dharma who were farmers and they were merchants and they were craftsmen and they were they were people who made things and they were, you know, people who made arrows and bakers and potters and people who were who lived in the culture and lived in the world and had families and dealt with money and all of the things that we all deal with. And so that Dharma path died out probably fairly early on. So we don't actually really have much of a sense of what to live a dharma informed life to really be guided by mindfulness to be guided by care to be guided by these values there's actually no roadmap you know especially when you really start to look at the the ethical path factors um of 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 right um speech right action and right livelihood uh those are the things in my life that i struggle with the most to be honest with you um how do i find my voice i talk talking right now you know how do i how do i express myself in a way that i can feel good about um action how do i do my work in this world and survival how do i survive how do i make money in this world ethically oh my god what a challenge that is so also too if you look in you know if you go on amazon or if you read or you listen to talks not much is said about these path factors but I don't know about you, when it comes to, to work and survival, I mean, I'm at work right now. I mean, this is the stuff that gets us. This is, this is if we cannot see Dharma practice as something that's implied in the work that we do and the actions that we take uh, and the way that we survive in the world, a lot of us feel this way. And I've learned this because I have a mentoring program and I've been kind of monitoring people for a long time. So I have a lot of my own kind of data. Uh, a lot of my own kind of research. And one of the things that I find, and you might find this is true for you, is people have a Dharma practice, right? They have a practice, they go on retreat, they, they have, and, then, and then they have their life. And those feel like very, very different things. And, and there's a desire, there's a wish to integrate those, but there's really not much, you kind of are just left to your, to your own devices. And I think it's safe to say when you look at the Eightfold Path and you look at the Buddhist teachings on the Eightfold Path, which is actually the quintessential teaching, if there is one. Um, clearly, in American culture, we've put all our eggs on the mindfulness basket. You know, most people see Buddhism as a system of meditative inquiry, which it certainly is. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think there's been too much emphasis placed on the importance of meditation and what goes on in the mind and not enough of emphasis or instruction or conversation about how do we bring it into all the other things that we're doing. 
And I think a lot of people, which is why I'm excited about the program, I think a lot of people are sitting in that space. They're just not really sure what to do or where to go or, you know, they go to their local Buddhist center, they like it, but they don't feel like they fit in or there's always just kind of like everybody feels like they, they're the odd man out. Uh, and I think it's true. I just don't, I just think that we don't, you know, we're early on. Buddhism in America is very early, early on. And so it probably would make sense that, that we're at this point, but trying to bring some of these ideas together. So let me pause there and I, I'll go further, but I just want to, um, I know I'm giving you guys a lot. Obviously, I'm excited and I've drinking some coffee, um, but I would love to hear any questions that you have about anything I've said so far or anything you want me to kind of unpack further. All right, I feel like I'm doing a good job then if you guys don't have any questions. Yes, please, Tia. Um, uh, you spoke a little bit earlier and you actually mentioned the Brahma Viharas and then the, the, in, in the tasks you were talking about being in kind of a non-reactive space. Um, how does or does that not, like, is that, are you thinking of that as like, like, being in equanimity or in an equanimous, which is a totally bizarre word, space, um, or are they? Is it separate, and that's why, and, and that's why you're saying non-reactive instead of equanimity, or well, there, yeah, I think is, you're there, onto is it related? Is it not related? Totally anymore? related. I think you're spot on. I think actually where they where they fit is right where you're saying there, and, and within that non-reactive space of the mind, when I'm not reacting, then I have access to kindness, to care. So we could call it the third noble truth, as it's typically called. That's all. So we just kind of use my third noble truth, nibbana, those ideas. That's a contemplative kind of mindfulness, and I think that that's where the Brahma Viharas live. So I think you're totally right on. That's exactly where I would put them. Right. So it's not just about like I'm glad you brought this up to you because it's not about this mindfulness, this just just watching business, just not watching and not reacting. That's too passive. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so, so, so when I'm in a reactive state of mind, kindness is kind of off the table, right? So interestingly enough, so if you look at the third noble truth, let me just use that language for a second, the task is to be in that space. And then the next thing is the first path factor, right view. Well, that's the right view is like, can I view things through the lens of kindness? Can I view things through the lens of care? Can I view things through gratitude, through equanimity? And then can I bring those into my intentions? And then can I bring those into my words? You see what I mean? So you're you're totally right. That that would be to me the cultivation side of it. You know, we so when I'm in that non-reactive space, now I can cultivate these qualities. So that that is exactly where we would put them. You're already onto it. That's good. What else do I have here that I want to get to? So yeah, so to just kind of keep going. So the cool thing about the Dharma, as you probably know, is there's lots of list of force. And, and so uh, there, there, there is a roadmap where that, you know, if you look at these lists of fours, you know, if you have the four noble truths and the, or the four tasks, let's call them that, that's what we call them, the four tasks, the four efforts, the four mindfulness. Now, if you take those lists and you invert them and you, you take the first one of each one and the second one of each one and the third one of each one, you get a whole nother list and they all line up in a very interesting kind of way. So we talk about that we, we, we embrace life, the first task. And how do we do that? Well, that we now we're into the first effort to prevent destructive forces in the mind, to embrace the body, the first foundation of mindfulness, to embrace our desire system, which is the first means of accomplishment. So what happens is it, it's hard to talk about it, but I just want to give you the, 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 the theory on this is that when you turn these lists of four on their sides, you get a whole different set. And so everything really starts to line up in a, in a nice way. And so just to give you what they are, you know, there's a, and this comes from um, 
this is in the canon, this is in the Abhidharma, this is in all Buddhist thought. They're called the seven uh, list bodhipakshas, the seven facets of awakening. Um, you know, it's the four foundations of mindfulness, the four great efforts, the four means of accomplishment, the five spiritual faculties, the seven awakening factors, and the eightfold path. Now, those are probably all lists you're familiar with. So we use those as kind of, again, not as Buddhist doctrine that you are being encouraged to believe with, but what we're saying is this is this is early canon. This is the roadmap that the Buddha left. Let's talk about it. And so we we everything falls into these four tasks. We develop mindfulness practices. We develop these ethics. And so um, the program is designed around those ideas. So that way, that, that's not too much stuff. That's not too many lists. So it gives us a fairly comprehensive. Um, set of of good dharma i think good dharma that respects the tradition uh and it respects the ideas of early buddhist thought but gives us enough of flexibility and also avoids the trappings of metaphysical claims um esoteric ideas um past future life ideas it just avoids all of that stuff not because that stuff is bad or that stuff is wrong but because it's just um we just don't know so we we really kind of politely put a lot of that stuff aside and allow ourselves to have these kinds of conversations. So we have uh, existential mindfulness. We have mindfulness that is trying to come to terms with our human dilemma. That is that is a set of mindfulness practice that puts us in touch with care, that puts us in touch with our bodies, that puts us in touch with, as Gil Franzdale puts it in his book, The Issue at Hand. What do you want to do with this life? You ever have that thought? And also what that does is that puts us in touch with our desire, which is another word that gets a bad reputation. But that's one of the list of four is desire, the four means of creativity. Desire is how we how we live. And so we have to be honest with ourselves about what we want, our desire systems, our, our sexuality, the quality of life that we think that we need to have. All of these things are super important and they're very subjective. So we're not interested in telling you how to navigate that. We're just interested in letting you know how goddamn important that is, right? So there's an existential mindfulness, which is, you know, a lot there. Uh, and then the second task of overcoming this reactivity, that's the therapeutic mindfulness. That's the kind of mindfulness that we see in mindfulness culture, MBSR, MBCT, all these mindfulness-based interventions, therapies are about coming to terms and overcoming uh, the the inner struggles of our psychological experience of our emotional experience so that is uh, part of it but it's not the whole story uh, the third task which is uh, Tia brought up the 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 nibonic the non reactive that is more of a mindfulness that is more of a contemplative nature uh, how do we live a contemplative based life how do we uh, move through the world how do we find ease and how do we deal with confusion in a way and then the fourth uh, aspect of mindfulness is ethical mindfulness which funnily enough i wrote a i wrote an ebook about 12 years ago called ethical mindfulness and i i i, I was teaching i developed this book and this program called ethical mindfulness about 12 years ago and i was teaching at, a, at addiction treatment conferences and i had some programs in nashville that was basically blending the foundations of mindfulness with the brahma viharas that was kind of where i started with all this stuff and i remember uh when it when I was getting it published, um, I remember one of my big disappointments was I had a publishing company and we we're having all these conversations and they did they didn't think it was good enough of an idea to be an actual book book, so I got downgraded to an ebook, um, which you can get for like a dollar ninety nine or if you email with me I'll send you the PDF I'm happy to share it with you it's about ninety pages, um, but I like to see this word coming back again so it's um. I always like to say that one thing I've been smart about is I tend to be ahead of the curve for some reason. Uh, but th these were the ideas where I was exploring many years ago, and that is an ethical mindfulness, and that is how we live, how we live our lives. Um, so let me just kind of drill down a little bit on this uh, to give you kind of maybe some inspiration on where this might be helpful. So, so if we look at, let's look at the Eightfold Path, because that is the system that we're using. So. Um, I think there's no argument that anybody would make that if you were to sit down with the Buddha and you were to sit down and ask him, hey, man, I really like your style. I've seen you talk a couple of times. I want to do your thing. What would I do? He would obviously say to cultivate the Eightfold Path. And he would say to cultivate, 
the Eightfold Path, to develop this. He wouldn't say sit on a cushion 30 minutes a day. He would say develop this Eightfold Path. And even when you look in the canon, when people go to him, as they did towards the end of his life, his followers were worried about like when he dies, people would say, well, if I come into contact with your Dharma later on, how will I know that what I'm coming into contact is, is your Dharma? How do I know it'll be real Dharma? And he always says, wherever you find the Eightfold Path, you find me. So that was really, I think, his gift, what he left behind uh, to us. Now, interestingly enough, if you look, there's not very many books on the Eightfold Path. And also, I will say this, and this is true. The Pali Canon has been largely ignored by the Buddhist tradition. You know, the Pali Canon has not really become of interest to anybody except for the Theravada, and in very, even in the Theravada booths, and very few monks can read the Pali. People don't actually know this also. The Theravada tradition is much more aligned with the Vasudhi Magga, the Path to Purification written by Buddha Gosa. Uh, that, that's their, that is the text that the Insight Theravada tradition uses much more so. So there really is actually kind of no tradition of the Pali Canon. And until the late 1800s, you had people like Reese David and Carol Davids who developed the Pali Text Society, in the late 1800s. So basically, since like the late 1800s, it's mostly been just kind of this study of like nerdy English academics. You know, we don't even have, we don't even have a translated version of the polytexts that are done from an academic perspective. They're all Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's great. I'm not in any interested in it at all or saying anything negative about Bhikkhu Bodhi, but um, we don't have, interestingly enough in the modern world, we don't really have uh, Sutta Central is good, but we don't have much there. In fact, uh, Kinchino Weber says this, and I think it's true. I think we've just been just started to scratch the surface of what is being offered in the pages and the ideas and the theories that are found in that Pali Canon. It's really coming to life kind of almost as we speak. So just just we, we want to remember that like this is the revered text. This is kind of the this is the canon. But it has been totally ignored by the Buddhist tradition for 2,500 years. You know, and there's been other texts that's been underdeveloped and stuff. And everything that we learn in Buddhism comes from that. And I don't say that to be negative. I just say that I think that that's mostly just interesting. I think that's an interesting phenomenon. I didn't know that till very recently. So um, when we look at that, we find the most underexplored um, aspect of the path, which I think we probably will when we get into doing, it's not really actually a training, I shouldn't have used that word. The MBEL program is a practice curriculum. Um, we're not, I'm not interested in training mindfulness teachers. I'm not interested in training people at all, actually. It's more of a, a practice curriculum. People come and practice it and we explore it and it's really much more that way. But I think you'll find that we, uh, we really wanna unpack and spend more time talking about the middle three path factors. So let's just talk about those for a minute. Right speech, um, which is the classic, translation i don't think that's very helpful a uh, right speech you get these sort of four gates they called is it is it kind is it timely is it useful uh you know we don't you don't get a lot there and when you look at the term and i think i did this for you guys actually for sfdc i went through these path factors uh the word is vacha sama vacha right speech i think we can just leave the word right out we don't need to make it right or wrong it's just what's the buddhist perspective on speech it's finding our voice and I think many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, really struggle with how we present ourselves to the world. How do you present yourself to the world? How do you interact with the world? How do you engage with the world? That is largely a vocal endeavor. How honest are we? How transparent are we? Do we even feel safe enough to fucking tell the truth? You know? We have to go pay somebody 250 bucks an hour to sit in a room with a noise machine so we can tell the truth, which I, which I do, and I think that's great, but I just think that it's a bit odd that it's come down to this. So when we look at the ethical implications of that, where we're really trying to use mindfulness contemplatively to say, how, how can we actually use our voice if, if what we're trying to do is liberate ourselves and the liberation process is developed through eight path factors, what does liberation through voice actually look like or even mean? You know, what a great question. I don't have the answer. That's the kind of thing that we want to do here is explore these ideas 
I don't really know. You know, I, I would say within the last couple of years, I haven't, I, I spent most of my life trying to find a, an authentic voice. Maybe that's the better word is authentic. How do we express ourselves in an authentic way? Most people find that they have a hard time doing it, but also people do report, and I've seen it many times, when you're able to do it, it feels so good. When you're able to sit down with another human being and actually have an honest conversation about the struggle and, and, and just being able to relate in a friendly kind of way, I, I don't think there's a better, I don't think there's anything I can say that I enjoy more than that. So why is that not, why is that so underexplored? The only person who's really done a lot in, in recent years is Orrin J. Sofer, who's an old friend of mine. He has a book. Um, He's, I don't even uh, say what you mean. I think it's called. He, he's really put a lot of his effort into mindful communication, um, but I think it's very underexplored. So we we want to we want to do that in the retreat context. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The actual program, and I'll put the link in there if you want to check it out. But is is that is is creating space? The, the other guy who's kicked ass on this is a guy named Gregory Kramer, who wrote a book called Insight Dialogue who actually recently wrote a book on the Eightfold Path, so be it. This is interesting. I'll say this. I probably shouldn't, but I will. Um, his, path, his book is called um, Whole Life Path. A Whole Life Path. Isn't that a great concept? Don't you want to have a whole life path? Gregory Kramer, I met him one time. I talked to him. He had a book, Insight Dialogue, very successful book. Doesn't teach at these big insight institutions. Doesn't get invited for some crazy, bizarre reason. Guy wrote a book on the Eightfold Path right? Great book. Could not get one Buddhist publication to publish the damn book. Shambhala didn't want it. Wisdom didn't want it. He couldn't get the book published and he'd already written a successful book. And I was like, the eightfold path, it's not that fucking esoteric of an idea. You can't find a Buddhist publisher to put out a book on the eightfold path. He had to put it out himself. Highly recommend it. Such a great book. Um, I just thought that was hilarious. You know? And so, uh, so there is some work that's been done here, but I think that as we move through retreats and as we connect with people and as we can use things like Zoom and breakout groups, I think a lot of us, and this is what I've heard and it's been true for me, I really value Dharma friends. I love connecting with people on a Dharma level. I love being able to be honest. I love being able to have these kind of conversations. And, you know, you go on a 10 day retreat, you you're in silence the whole time and then they break silence and you have dinner with the people you run retreat with and then you go home, which is great. That's the retreat model. But I think it's created some unintended consequences. And that is, we feel like we don't have anybody to talk to. You have a question? Please, anytime, just anytime. An observa this is an observation, uh, David, was I'm noticing in Zoom, uh, say uh, in secular recovery programs uh, here in, in the Bay Area, uh, atheist, agnostic, free thinkers, and others. It's just the, the format has turned into just a conversation. And it's been such an attraction to people to just have a conversation. We allow crosstalk, but it has to be supportive, respectful, and about recovery. But then it creates these wonderful conversations that I can't have, say, in a physical AA room or sure. NA room. So it's just, I'm appreciating that Zoom has really brought this forth and that it's being brought forth. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. I think there's, yeah. I think people have a desire for that kind of space. Yes, you know? absolutely. And so, and if we look at the next path, that next path factor, which is known as right action, sama kamanta. Now, most of you probably know the word for action is not, but the word for action is karma, kama, kama. The word isn't kama. The word is kamanta. What does that word mean? It doesn't mean action. It means more like actually your business, your work, your vocation. Vocation is a good word because it has a religious, spiritual connotation. So right action isn't about behaving properly. Uh, of course, it's part of it, but it, it's not about just the five precepts. It's about, so I, the way I think about it is, is that my vocation, what do I feel called to do? Now, what I feel called to do, this is where these two really, I think, come alive, is we get them confused. So most of us think, well, right work, doing my work, well, that's the next path factor, right livelihood, right? I don't think that's true. Because the work, when I think about my work, 
a lot of us like you we recovery is a perfectly good example when you go when you when you when you're in recovery you're doing recovery work you're clearly not getting paid so the work that we're doing is how we're coming to terms with ourselves doing our work um vocation what do we feel called to do uh doing our dharma work doing our therapy work doing doing our work as human beings is really more what that's about now the next one sama ajiva ajiva just means for life it's not really a livelihood it's not what you do for money what you do for money is probably maybe it's your work i i feel like i'm lucky i feel like my what i do for work and my work are, are the same it's and, and that comes with some unintended consequences also i can assure you that much um but i think it's about survival <clears throat> most people don't go to their job every day because they find it to be meaningful most people go to their job every day because they get money and we live in a world we live in a money society and if you want to survive in america you got to work you know unless you have resources other places but most people don't now here's the hard part and i hear this all the time from people people feel like they want to have a dharma practice and they want to go on retreats and they want to get dedicate and one of, and i don't i'm not going to say it's an excuse but one of the reasons people say well, i can't do my work because i'm trying so hard to survive which is a very which is a very reasonable argument to be made because it's true for a lot of people. The hard thing is for us living in secular society is we have to figure out some way to do both at the same time. You know, you know, how do I survive and do my work? You know, people, you know, the guy who gets up early in the morning and hits the seven o'clock a.m. meeting and works eight hours and then goes and hits an eight p.m. meeting, like he's doing both, man. The recovery analogies work good here because this is. You know, because people in recovery, they have to have a spiritual life where they're working on themselves and they have to survive at the same time. I think that kind of thinking really, really applies here. And it's not so much my job is in the way of my spiritual practice, but how can my job become my spiritual practice? Or it puts us in all kinds of dilemmas like, well, why do I need to make so much money? Why do I live in a city that I can't afford? It puts us back into the existential question. So now we're really having a Dharma practice that's really looking at it. It's looking at our relation, our relationship to money and stuff and to things like debt. And, you know, what choices can I make? Do, can I move to a different place? Can I, and I, I bring all this up because I went through all of this and I didn't see it as my Dharma practice. And I did a little bit, but I wish I had done that more because when I, moved out here to Western Colorado, I had gone through, I, I was in a car accident in 2016, a motorcycle accident, and I almost died. Um, and I, you know, recovered from that. And that was right at the beginning of ATS kind of falling apart. And um, I knew that that was, I knew I, I resigned from Against the Stream two years before everything went down over there. Um, and I knew that, and I reconnected with some of my early teachers, Steve Armstrong and Steve Smith, and I and, and I and I knew that I wanted to teach Dharma, uh, but I knew that I was in a Donna situation where I'm teaching and I'm asking, you know, people to offer generous money to help me live. And I, I'm like, I can't live in a city like Los Angeles and do that. Like, I don't feel comfortable asking people for money to live when my lifestyle is so goddamn expensive that I just kind of, for me, that was a bit of an ethical dilemma. Um, so I moved rural and we, we, we have a different lifestyle. Me and Shannon walk, my wife, Shannon, we have, you know, we have a couple kids and we live out here and we don't need to make uh, LA money or Bay area money or Portland money or Boston money, you know? And so uh, that was a whole thing. And I, and I, I kind of saw that as my practice, but I wish I had kind of, I wish I was where I am today more with that to be like, oh, this is actually uh, my practice. And, and the thing about the hope with MBEL, I think, is really helping people. One of the things that I enjoy the most as a teacher is when the Dharma really comes alive for people. It really, really comes alive and they really feel like, oh my God, like I'm living this. Because it is, it, it's about living. Um, it's not about having a practice and then having a life. So part of it is, is really trying to integrate those. So when we look at voice, finding my voice, doing my work, whatever that means for me, 
right? What does that, what does that mean for you? Some of us, we, we do our, we, maybe we're trying to work out our childhood. Maybe we're trying to work out our destructive relationships. Maybe we're trying to work out our loneliness. Maybe we're trying to work out our drug addiction. Maybe we're trying to work out all of that stuff. You know, you know, we, most of us get into this stuff because we notice there's some work that kind of needs to be done. Right. And then how do I do that? And survive. Yeah, I see a question there. Is that Renata? Did I say that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I do think that there could be some usefulness to um, applying, say, um, the Eightfold Path to real life work environments. A lot of us work in, say, say in tech, for example, it's very cutthroat. Yeah. And you don't, you're actually in, in interfacing more with um, um, application programming interface most of the time than actually other people. And so even drawing the line of what is right speech when you were working within a certain application and our fields are becoming so specialized that even getting down to all those, all those rules and applying them individually now um, to, to our specific um, fields, I found more and more difficult so I do think that is something that's worth investigating is how do people apply, um, say, right speech to their individual work that they, they've chosen feel, whether they happen to like it or not. <laughs> yeah, I love that question. I, and, and, and part of it, too, I think, from the reverse engineers is that is, is just putting the idea of ethics on the table. You know what I mean? Of like, hey, like, you know, because you raise a really, really good point is that in a lot of these, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, this kind of thinking around mindfulness could infiltrate um, that aspect of society, workplace, companies, leadership. I mean, people like in the secular sector have been doing the three years, the work of Daniel Goleman, his emotional intelligence and leadership work. Um, even Google search inside yourself, I think, with highlighting some of these ideas. So it's not that it hasn't been done. Uh, or attempted, but it's really, really under underserved and undervalued. And it was like me and me and Shannon were joking about this because because we have this program and I do these programs a lot. And I'm I'm not I'm not famous and people don't know about me very much. And I prefer to keep it that way. But I always try. To, I need, always usually need to get like 25 people to sign up for these things so I can, you know, adhere to my contract at these centers that I that I get. But we're like I'm like oh man like ethical living is not, you know, this is not an exciting topic. We're going to, you know what I mean? It's so boring and drab, but it's like a part of me likes that because I'm like, you know, this is, this is how do we um, have a conversation about ethics without having a theory on what that word means. So, so a, a lot of this, I think the hope um, we'll see, cause I have no idea what's going to happen here, to be honest with you. Um, is this to be more of a dialogue kind of program? Like you mentioned these things you're having. Um, so having the retreat structure a little bit different, I think is, and, and, and Stephen Batcher has been doing these. He has a organization in Europe called Bodhi College. If you haven't checked out Bodhi College, they're great. They've been doing retreats over there and they do these retreats and they do, uh, you know, not so much Dharma talks, but more like a pre presentation of an idea for 20 minutes, putting people in groups. And so it becomes more, of a conversation um, rather than um, the hierarchies that we see, which, you know, have their role. But to some degree, I think that there needs to be some space where we can question these ideas and, and say, hey, like, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. So I will tell any other any other questions or thoughts you want to I hope I'm making enough of sense. This is all. This is a a big thing to unpack in 90 minutes, and this is the first time I've done it. So, thanks for letting me. Thanks for being my guinea pigs. Uh, yeah. Thank go you. ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely fantastic. Just today, uh, having a conversation with uh, uh, you know a, my a Dharma teacher, and 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 his observation was, it's really nice, Snowy, when you get out of here, you know. When you get out of here in, in our conversation, you come back down to here. And, I, and I'm telling dirty jokes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm relaxed. And he says, but you come in here, you're all in here. And then, you know, then slowly but surely we move into just being ourselves, which is something you've mentioned earlier. And, and it's hard to find. Uh, I, I, it's a balance. And I'm the only one that can find it. Uh, find it but I also appreciate others 
who can point it out to me and say, no, you know, you're here, but when you're here, even better, you know? It takes that a little while to it. drop that 12 inches, doesn't it? <laughs> Thanks. And that's where the voice, for me, the voice is down here. You know, you could, what is it, what is it, you know, to speak from the body rather than from the head is the whole thing. So I, I'll, I'll say a few words about, about this program and I'll actually put the, uh, in the chat, if you like, you can steal, copy, paste, there's a link here to the definition. So, so what we're, there's a couple of people doing this. I'm not the only person doing this. This isn't my thing. This is just something that people all over the world actually are, are doing this MBEL. There's a guy in uh, Secular Buddhist Network. They're doing an eight-week online course. But I wanted to do something a little bit bigger because I like to do these programs. So starting in 2024, and hopefully every year, we're doing these eight-month mindfulness-based ethical living programs. So the eight-month program has two residential retreats, two seven-day retreats, one in March, one in September and it has an online course. So when you sign up, the course will begin. It's actually the registration is open now. A couple of people have signed up. Um, it, it will start January 1st and there will be uh, an online like teaching library. So a lot of these lists and a lot of the things I've talked about, there'll be an online version of those where you can log in, you can read, you can watch some videos, you can actually learn the program. These lists will be unpacked, they'll be described, they'll be talked about, you'll have all of that kind of academic stuff and that will slowly roll out every month a new module will open and you'll have stuff there'll be two live teaching sessions every month so there'll be an hour and a half session where we'll do a talk a meditation and a discussion on one of the topics there'll also be a one time a month one hour just practice session which will just be a seated practice and some questions um Stephen Batchelor will be doing quite a few of those from France. He's not going to be at the live retreats. I just want to be straight up about that. He's not going to be in person, but he'll probably four times will be on teaching live, doing talks on Zoom. Uh, and he'll probably will Zoom him into some of the retreats as well. Uh, there'll also be some guest teachers. Um, and then there'll be this these seven day retreats. So the re first one will be in March. And then the other one would be in um, September. So the so the program will end at the retreat in September. Um, and so, you know, we, we it will be limited. It won't be that big. We want it to be intimate. I think that we'll probably max it. I don't think there'll be more than 40 people. I think that's the, the most we'll take. Um, I and we need 25 to make it work. So we need to get 25 signed up by September. So I feel pretty confident that we can do that. Um, it will be at Big Bear Retreat Center, which is in Big Bear, Big Bear, California. It's a really new retreat center. It's lovely. Um, there are things, the, the, you know, the, the, the place is set up that's two people in a room. Uh, there's a single room option. It's a little more expensive, but you can do that as well. So it's, it, it, the places are, their cabins, they're small. The food is great. The, the place is gorgeous. Um, so that's where we're doing it. There's a link. I just put it in the chat. And so our hope is to, um, you know, I teach Dharma retreats all the time. I'm happy to go to a place and teach a retreat, but I don't, one of the things that I can just be honest about that I valued, and I think a lot of this arose during COVID is I actually much more prefer long-term relationships with people. Like I just got done teaching retreat at, at Southern Dharma in North Carolina, which was great. I went there, but you know, I, I show up, there's 25 people sitting in front of me, none of which I know. 25 strangers having this intent and intimate retreat experience. I don't know what they know. I don't know what they don't know. It's kind of difficult to navigate those kinds of spaces. And I'll probably always do those. I probably have to do those. But what I really like to do is I just finished this 15 month program that was 25 people over 15 months, three retreats, people get to know each other. So our hope is to do these once a year. So we do these eight month programs, four months off, eight month programs. And, and maybe, maybe, you know, people will start doing, maybe SFDC will have a secular, will have a mindfulness-based ethical living class once a week. And somebody who's taken the eight month program, who's trained in mindfulness will teach it. And maybe this will become something that people will do and it will be available. That That is kind of the hope. But like I said, I don't have, I don't have like some master plan worked out about how this is gonna go down. I mean, I just, uh, so this is the first kind of uh, big offering that we're going to do. And um, I think it's gonna be great. Um, and I'm really, really excited to to bring this out. I think it's really well-designed and thorough. Um, and the other thing that, I, that I've also heard people say that's been true for me is, it's great to go on retreat, but people want to connect with each other a little bit more. 
they want a little bit more teaching. So like, even like at the M bell retreats, there's not going to, we're not going to do this one hour Dharma talk business, which is fine. I love Dharma talks. I give them all the time. I love to sit through them, but the, the, the teaching sessions will be more like 90 minutes or two hours in the morning where I will present the teachings on, let's just say the four great efforts. And I'll say, here's, here's, here's the four great efforts. Here's what they are. Here's what the Pali Canon says. Here's how you can practice them. Here's, here, here's what I think. And then I'm going to put people in groups. And then you're going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes in a group of four or five. And we'll do that for a while. And then we'll all come out and, and then we'll have a big conversation with that. What do you think? What did your group say? What did your group say? You know, and so we're, we're going to be doing more of that. So the mornings will be more education, a uh, bit more talking. The afternoons will be more mindfulness practice. The evening sessions will be uh, Brahma Vihara practices. There'll be some days that are total silence. We'll dip in and out of silence. So it'll be, it'll be a, a much more rich kind of retreat experience. It will, maybe you won't have the silence and the concentration you might develop on a silent retreat, but that's not what we're doing. Um, we're, we're hoping that people can, can practice together and sit together and have conversations about things that are actually important to them, uh, all within the context of the Eightfold Path, uh, of these ideas and so on and so forth. So, so you know, I'll also put my, e I also too, I'm, like I said, I'm not very well known. So if you email me, I will email you back. I can't tell you how many unreturned emails I've gotten from Dharma teachers over the years. That's my, my email address is satisila74 at gmail. Um, oh, you're in Australia. Would the course work for me? Well, you could do it. You'd have to fly over, which I know is probably quite hard to do. Um, at some point, I do suspect there will be an online version, but I, I, I'm not there yet. We don't really have it also too, just to say a few words about our organization, me and my wife, Shannon, uh, are putting this program out through our non, we have a nonprofit organization called the Secular Dharma Foundation. Uh, and we have done programs in the past. We have some online courses now. Um, and we are getting ready to do some more things. This is one of the big offerings that we're doing. So it's done through the nonprofit organization. Um, and so that's when you sign up, you'll go through that. Um, why did I say that? And so, so we might do some stuff. We just don't have the administrative bandwidth or the technical technical bandwidth to do. So to just do like 40 people over the course of eight months is like way more than we can chew off. But I would imagine there will be, I know that someone asked a question in Australia, there will be uh, the Secular Buddhist Network will do an online class at some point. We might do a hybrid model at some point. We won't do it this year, we talked about it. But if this goes well, the next year we might do um, a hybrid model where we people can come to the retreat and they can do it from home and maybe we zoom in the retreat stuff, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, so I guess maybe we have a few minutes left. I'd love to just see any questions or concerns or yeah, please, Tia. Uh, I, I, this one's a little technical and you probably and you might have said it, but there it's two one week retreats in person yes. retreats. So two one week two weeks, not in a row, in California. Yes, right. Okay. And if you click on that link, all that stuff is right in there. It's pretty descriptive. Yeah, so it's like, it's a, it's a Sunday, and then there's Sundays to Sundays, which is helpful, I think. Um, you know, there's one in March and then one in September. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a commitment, but not too much. Great stuff. Great stuff, David. Looking forward to Thank following you. you along the way. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I'm glad that you sent me your email. I'll reach out to you. This is now we, uh, yeah. some, poly, some poly stuff that I've been reading. Oh, good. Yeah, and also too, like in that email link, there's, you know, if you want to kind of uh, learn more, like there, there's a YouTube clip in there of me and Stephen Batchelor. I'm interviewing him. It's a 17 minute video of him and I talking about it. And he, even if you go to YouTube, there's a video of him talking about it. So there's, there's some stuff out there already. So if you want to kind of learn more or hear more, you know, he, he, he describes it in, in the video. I interview him. That's in the, in the link that I sent and you can email me. Um, and if you know, people are interested, send it out. If you email me, I'll send you the PDF. I mean, this is like, we're, this is all, we're sharing this. This is like, nobody owns this. We're not, we're not also, we're not trying to systematize this. There might be other people teaching it in different ways. Um, it's really, we 
don't want there to be kind of experts, if you will, on this. Um, but because it's so early on, you know, uh, we so we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. You know, we'll and so. Um, but I also do want to say, like I said at the beginning, this is really designed and meant to be a companion to anything that you've ever done in Dharma, Buddhist practice. There's not, it's really, I would say it's, it's friendly, um, you know, and so uh, it's just a different way, a different model of doing things that's really um, trying to create the open, the biggest open door. So people, no matter what your background is, if you're an atheist or if you're a Buddhist, if you're not Buddhist, if you're a Christian, whatever your religious beliefs and that stuff might be is totally, we don't have a problem with any of that. That's, that's not what this is. See here. Yeah, sorry about yeah, the um, travel is not an option right now. I, I get that we and who knows there might be somebody down in Australia at some point who might be doing it. I mean, Stephen has developed this program. There are people all over the world doing stuff. So I think if you stay in touch with me, if you haven't, uh, let me put my website in here. Yeah, if you if you're just kind of interested in this in a general way, one thing I would recommend that you do is just sign up for my email list on my Dave Smith Dharma. And I can tell you, just so you know, uh, we don't send out a lot of emails. So you're not going to sign up for my email list and get an email every day. We send probably like eight emails a year. Um, but most of the stuff that I do and, 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 and stuff in the space is on there. So if you want to get some updates, if other people are doing stuff with, with MBAL, we'll, we'll definitely be promoting those. It's like I said, this is not competitive. This is nobody owns us. I just, um, there's a guy, there's a doctor in Germany, in Hamburg, who's been doing this for a couple of years. There's a woman who's starting it in Japan. These guys in, in New Jersey are doing an eight an eight week program. So there's a lot of us doing different versions of it. I'm just doing probably the first really long kind of thorough version of it um, and hope to do it for many, many years to come. I just, I just don't know. So, so you, you guys should come, tell your friends, send it out, let people know. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I don't have much more to say other than thank you. And if anybody has any last minute questions or comments, I think they put something in about, you put something in the chat about Donna. Uh, that's not really why I'm doing this, but if you want to offer Donna to the SFDC, you should, uh, because running, as I've run meditation centers in the past, it's quite difficult. Uh, and I think what they're doing is quite good. Um, and I like that it's a Dharma collective and uh, I hope you guys, I'm glad you guys got a brick and mortar again. And I, uh, I want to thank Noam. I know he's not here this evening. Who's always been generous and you guys have always invited me and I um, really appreciate uh, anytime I get invited to share, to share this space with everybody. So I, I greatly appreciate your kind attention this evening.